Hey there, we'll start the Cloudcast in just a second. But if you're listening to this podcast, you already know that the IT transformations we're going through today depend on a lot more than just the raw technology itself. I'm John Mark Troyer, and I am organizing The Reckoning, a conference in Half Moon Bay, California, on September 13th and 14th. At The Reckoning, we'll talk about how technologists can take charge of their careers, communicate more effectively, and create a future IT that does not suck. Invest in yourself and come join us at this community event. Listeners of the Cloudcast can get $100 off by using the code CLOUDCAST. Go to signup.techreckoning.com to register. Now here's Brian and Aaron from the Massive Studios with another exciting episode of the Cloudcast. Cloudcast Media presents, from the Massive Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is The Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to The Cloudcast. Uh, We're coming to you live uh, from MesosCon here in Seattle. Uh, First off, uh, a big huge thank you to the Linux Foundation for once again including us as a media sponsor for the event. Um, today, uh, we've actually got, uh, the big boss man <laughs> when it comes to Mesos. Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, uh, Benjamin Heinemann. Um, and so I'm going to let you kind of do the introduction here so I don't mess it up too sure. bad, but go ahead and introduce yourself. And then I'm going to actually get a surprise, uh, co-host as well that I'm going to introduce. All right. That sounds great. Yeah, I don't know about that big boss man comment, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So I am um, uh, uh, I was co-creator of the Mesos project when I was a PhD student at Berkeley, along with um, Matej Zaharia and Andy Andy Kowinski. And those two names might be familiar because they're uh, big guys in the Spark community. In fact, uh, Spark was one of our very first frameworks that we built on top of Mesos, uh, actually just as a demo framework <laughs> to uh, to see that you could build other kinds of distributed systems on top. And, and then it turns out that that kind of took a life of its own and, and really was really has been very, very successful to date. Um, but from there, I, uh, I, my background is I, I went to Twitter, where um, Twitter was interested in, in kind of getting uh, a cluster management-like technology similar to what uh, a bunch of folks that had left Google and gone to Twitter were used to. Uh, and that's really where, where Mesos had a lot of great support and growth. Um, and since then, um, founded a company called Mesosphere, and uh, now we're um, uh, trying to bring Mesos and all the frameworks on top to whoever, uh, whoever wants to take advantage of it. Awesome. And then... Our co-host waiting in the wings patiently, Nick Weaver, longtime friend of the show. Um, gosh, I think the first time you were on the show was like sub episode ten or something like that. A long time ago. I know <laughs> that was a long time ago, but it's awesome because at the end of the day, Nick has kind of really kept up with you know kind of the journey a lot of the listeners have have gone through over the years, um, and so Nick's career has really probably. Uh, a lot more so than a lot of the other folks out there has kind of paralleled the industry. Um, Nick's been able to pretty successfully ride the waves so far. <laughs> so you mean fake my way through? Exactly. And so, so Nick, what's your what's your latest gig? Uh, I so I work for Intel. Um, I uh, started there last year, and I run a prototyping team uh, that actually gets to work with great companies like Mesosphere. And I run orchestration and scheduling for the SDI team for Intel. Cool. And so let's dig into Mesos a, a little bit here. So um, going back a, a bit, it's been almost, well, uh, a little over a year since we uh, last talked Mesos. We talked it with uh, Dave Lester from Twitter on show 155, um, July of last year. And one of the biggest probably questions that, that we seem to get from the listeners these days um, is, first of all, break it down a little bit of Mesos versus Kubernetes. Because I think probably, you know, when we, we talked before, Mesos was, was relatively new on the scene, and certainly Kubernetes wasn't a, as much of a name um, in, the, in the space as it is now. So give us a little bit of the basics. Sure, sure. It's interesting, yeah. We, we started the, the Mesos project back in uh, 2009, which seems like an eternity ago, <laughs> um, uh, when we were at Berkeley. And, uh, and, and we actually had a great relationship with the, the, the Google folks who uh, funded, our, f- funded the lab. Um, in fact, at the time they were uh, so so Borg, which is a uh, um, Google's you know internal cluster manager that they still use today. 
they were looking at doing some kind of an evolution of Borg, and uh, they were calling that Omega. And in fact, they've, they've since written a paper about that that you can go check out. Um, and so a lot of the ideas that they were thinking about doing in Omega actually uh, really mimicked a lot of the ideas that we were doing in, in Mesos. And I think the reason for that is because uh, cluster management is, is, is not a, a new topic at all. I mean, 2009 is actually nothing compared to the guys in 1991 that were doing P, you know, PBS, a portable batch system, and, and, and um, you know, running things like Torque and, um, for, 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 for MPI, and then the Maui scheduler for PBS. You know, you know, cluster management is a really, really old topic. And um, so what, what we were really doing in 2009 is we were trying to figure out, well, what is... It, well, well, first we realized, hey, a lot of data center operators could really use something like cluster management. But then we realized that a whole bunch of these things existed. In fact, a, a really well-known one that's still used quite a bit today is Condor, which came out of, out of the University of, uh, of Wisconsin. Um, there's quite a bit of financial institutions that use that. And so you know, what, what we were kind of saying was, well, what, um, you know, if we were to build something that was more applicable, more modern today, that wasn't just these kinds of cluster managers uh, like, like Condor, what would that look like? Um, and uh, and the reason I give this background is because that's really helpful for kind of differentiating something like Kubernetes versus uh, versus a Mesos. Because what we really did is we said, well, we would we want this two level model, um, and because that's what a lot of the cluster managers didn't have. The cluster managers were this pretty uh, you know prescriptive. You know, here's a declarative way of describing what I want you to run, and then you know, people would just submit that, and then the cluster manager would figure out how to actually run that. And uh, we recognized that well. Oftentimes, software might want to be able to, say, submit something and then have the system say, well, I can't run this right now for whatever reason, then do something else, or, 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 you know, or who knows, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so with this two-level model that we really put into to Mesos, to us, this was this evolution of cluster management, um, and it was, it was not just kind of this declarative specification that you submit. Now, what I think is really interesting about that is fundamentally what that means is that you got to write software to use something like Mesos as a cluster manager, right? You got to write software that's going to be that second level that's a, that's actually going to do stuff, and um, and so on. On top of Mesos, you end up having these things that we call schedulers, uh, and that's a, you know it's probably too strong a word because it scares people away <laughs> when, they, when, they, when, they, when they hear the word scheduler. But but really, it's just it's this 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 level that actually communicates with Mesos and launches things, and um, but it's just you know again the, the focus is on the two levels in the in the Kubernetes world the focus is much more on the single level. So again, it's back to that world of, oh, you want to submit a job, you write this declarative specification, and then you submit it to, 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 to Kubernetes. And then it takes information, and if it can schedule it, great. And if it can't, you know, it waits until it could potentially schedule it. Um, and, and so that's like, you know, very fundamentally from a, from a you know, architectural perspective, how, how those two things really differ. But the nice thing about that, as I, as I, as I chatted about earlier, earlier in my keynote today, and as you can, you can see by going to the, the interweb yourself, is um, you can run something like a Kubernetes on top of a Mesos because, you, you know, you, you can run something. That's basically what we have to do. You know, you have to end up building some kind of a first-level scheduler in the Mesos world to launch tasks. You, you know, you need, for a human that just wants to launch a task, you need that declarative specification layer, right, of course, yeah. which in the Mesos world is, is, is um, the, the really common ones are Aurora, which is what, what Twitter uses, and, um, and, uh, um, and, and Marathon, which is, which is what, 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 what we promote at, at Mesosphere. Um, but plenty of other organizations have built their own. You know, I, I, Apple's a good example. They built one called Jarvis. Um, and so they built their own... Uh, Layer that kind of that is that interface between the humans or, or the CI CD system or whatever it is that launches the apps. Uh, and for, for Apple, you know, it was great because they, they were able to take advantage of the primitives in Mesos and then do something very customized to their environment for how they wanted to run things. Um, but a lot, a lot of other folks, they just say, oh, yep, the way that this is described as an app is perfectly fine. I'll take this. I'll run this. This is good. Um, and for those folks, you know, they'll just use a marathon or a Kubernetes or, or any of the other, other frameworks on top. What did, uh, so Apple, you mentioned how Apple's using Jarvis and they moved to it. What did, uh, what did Apple use before that? Like, what did they migrate from? Yeah, so, so w w when I'm talking about Apple, I should, I should be pretty specific here. The Siri team at Apple. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. 
Yeah, so so um, uh, uh, they actually uh, had a public meetup talk a, a couple of weeks ago, and, and um, they're actually talking tomorrow in, in one of the keynotes in, in Mesa's Con as well. So uh, before that, they were on virtualization. Yeah. So so they were they were running virtual machines, and um, uh, you know I, I think I think they were they had two interests. One is they wanted an even better way of of managing all the things they were running, um, and two is I think that they saw advantages in going directly to the bare metal. Yeah. Um, and for something like Siri, which is uh, which is compute bound it's most definitely compute bound right. they saw they definitely saw, saw advantages and it's one of those things where as, as an academic you always hear about the virtualization tax uh, uh, but you never you never really see it in, in right. practice and then this was a clear example of of uh, I, I, I forget the exact numbers but something like 20 to 30 percent performance incru- improvement oh, that's for their, amazing for wow seriously which is which is a really really big deal yeah. well and it explains too so there was kind of a, a running joke on Twitter a little bit this morning so Apple is a, a sponsor at least they have a booth and and it's just this blank table, and it just says in front of it, you know, Apple. Yeah. And there's no one there. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, how Apple? Yeah. You know, they just, they have a table. They yeah. have a presence, but yeah. no one's... And then, but then we found out, oh, okay, they're going to be yeah. talking tomorrow. Speaking tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, 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 it's funny, you know. It's, um, I, I think a lot of these, these older companies are, are... Bigger companies are starting to get in the, how do we do this whole open source thing? And, right. uh, you know, I mean, we talked today about running running Mesos on Windows, and and that was driven by you know the Microsoft folks. Like they really want to be involved in the open source community yeah. now. And, and so. That, yeah, so so tell us. So for those that don't know, it, you, you, on the, in the keynote this morning, you kind of did a, a little, you know live demo yeah. of of Windows, and yeah. and kind of it was really interesting. Uh, I actually had to step out, but you know the the Twitters kind of went crazy for a little while there. Um, so tell everyone about it and how it all came about and, and quite frankly, why? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> right? um, it almost seems like you're crossing the streams there. Yeah, totally, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, you know to, to give Microsoft credit for a second, um, uh, they, you know, they, they reached out to us originally to do some stuff on Microsoft Azure because they're trying to make a big, big push for uh, running, running even Linux on Azure, of course. Um, and uh, so, so, so we did some work with them um, last uh, last spring. I think you know when you look at the big clouds or the ones that I, most people think are the big clouds: <laughs> uh, uh, Amazon, um, uh, Microsoft, and Google. And um, it, basically, what you had was you had Amazon, who they've got a lot of tech around for both running virtual machines as well as now for some container stuff. They've got the ECS service. Um, you've got Google, um, who uh, has been working on Kubernetes, and that's kind of the way they say, you know, we'll spin up Kubernetes inside of virtual machines for you, and then and then you can just launch stuff from there. And um, so I think it was a great partnership opportunity with, with Microsoft, they said, well, hey, why don't, why don't we run, run uh, uh, Mesos and Mesosphere uh, s- s- technology on, on, on Azure? So that's kind of where, where, where the partnership started. And then, um, uh, you know, the way that it really evolved was we had, uh, interestingly enough, a lot of, of companies that we've been working with who uh, they ask us, hey, can you run our um, ASP.NET apps, our Exchange server, our uh, uh, Microsoft SQL server, and our SharePoint? And uh, and then you kind of find out the complexity of actually running these things in an HA mode, yeah. and yeah. you sort of take a step back and you say, you, "There's a there's a bunch of consultants and and, and and people in the world that are are going through the same struggle that folks in the Linux space we're we're dealing with." And hey, these are just resources. We're just launching tasks. Why is this so different in in, in the Linux world versus the the the, the Windows world? So um, next thing we know, uh, we had a bunch of great support from from Microsoft, including some some full time engineers that they wanted to put on doing all the stuff in the, the open, completely open source, and nothing that they that they did is is is, is proprietary. And uh, and we said, great, you know, we're trying to grow the community, and we had enough people asking us to do things. We had people um, playing with uh, trying to uh, build Mesos with uh, POSIX emulation layers, just so they could run it themselves on Windows, and. We just thought, why not? Let's let's make this make this be a legit thing. And uh, a couple of months later, uh, I was able to do a demo this morning, which was pretty cool. Which yeah. was, you know, launching. I mean, t- to me, the fun part was actually launching the Java app because launching the ASP.NET app just on Windows, okay. Launching the Linux right. app just on Linux, okay. But the Java app, I compiled that Java app on Linux, actually on my Mac. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I compiled that Java, you know, on my Mac, <laughs> and, and, I, and, and I ran it on Linux and Windows. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And, you know, and then it's just again, it's you know, assuming you're not doing crazy things like trying to open uh, slash proc right, <laughs> in, right. in, in your Java app. You know, yeah. if you're actually adhering to the fact that you're trying to write portable software, sure. Who cares where you're getting the resources from? They're just resources to run your apps. Yeah. No. So, like with with, I mean, if you look back at like early virtualization, I mean, the Windows. The ability to run Windows on, I mean, ultimately, all, all the hypervisors were Linux based, like x86 Linux based back in the early days, right? Well, not the old days, but um, the Windows support was a huge switchover for virtualization. So, what is all these Windows shops out there, like Enterprise, a majority of Enterprise runs Windows. I mean, what are they thinking right now? And, like, what are the next steps for them as far as, like, the idea of scheduling? So, like, you mentioned the concept, like, some of these yeah. Linux concepts, the HPC concepts are pretty yeah. common, but the enterprise people like how do you grok this and how do you like what's the way to approach this for the, for these people yeah yeah i mean i mean that's uh, in in a nutshell that's that's what we're trying to do as a business with with mesosphere as well is, is directly be the conduit to the to the enterprise for um uh for the open source communities and the extremely scalable tech companies like twitter and right. some of the other organizations that 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 use use the open source software um and i think you know i i think for the, for those organizations i think the the way you really present this stuff is uh, there's a lot of automation that you can really do. Um, that automation can save you a ton of money, whether it be because it can drive up resource utilization mm-hmm. or minimize uh, operator costs. Um, but it also just it it makes you it makes you more flexible and more more able to deal with stuff that happens as, as, as a business and it sometimes kind of high level and fluffy but like yeah. you know the but but, but I, I think that the concrete things are if if users can run jobs if, if they can try to run things sooner and faster um uh that's a real win and if organizations can deal with failures in data centers and doing maintenance on top of rack switches and all sorts of other stuff and that's completely disconnected from the people that are actually trying to write their software and run their software again that's that's you know a really big win and so um so the, you know the conversations that we're effectively having with 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 enterprise companies is this is why you know you're you should be interested in in in, in, in this evolving technology and um and 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 then i mean to me like it's 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 about then just showing them, you know, like actually like sitting them down and saying, let's take one of your apps, let's try to get it up and running and, and let's do it. And, and, you know, I still think there's some parts of, of our ecosystem that's still evolving, especially around containerization, that's not fully figured out yet. You know, what yeah. does it mean to have state in a container? You know, right. what does it mean to have a IP per, for a container? Is it, you know, as the container yeah. moves, does it get to keep the IP as you migrate Containers, you know, you know, all sorts of that kind of stuff is still not figured out yet. But there's a lot of stuff we could still really do effectively. Yeah. Well, and us. let's actually dig into that a, a bit. So, Mesosphere specifically has DCOS, Data Center Operating System, um, and people kind of talk about this idea of yeah, durable and declarative in- infrastructure for the applications. And, and so, how does DCOS kind of accomplish yeah. something like that? Right? If you kind of peel that back one layer further, right? What's the the under the hood? Yeah, yeah. Well, so. Um, uh, the biggest thing under the hood is, is Mesos. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, and then um, the other piece is, you know, the, the most well-defined other piece under the hood is, is, is this scheduler I was mentioning earlier, um, this framework on top called, called Marathon. And, um, and, and again, you know, I, I think the way you can really think about how these two things couple with one another is, um, you know, Mesos is, is, is more the imperative API mm-hmm. model. Mm-hmm. And um, imperative can be extremely nice for whether it's performance things you want to do or flexibility in, in, in the way systems can be built on top. And then marathon on top is really the declarative. And, and that, again, getting back to the Kubernetes example we were talking about earlier, Kubernetes is really a declarative model. You know, here's the tasks I want to run. You submit, and then the, the realization of those tasks get launched. Um, and... Um, and then, you know, what we've done around DCOS as well is, is, is really just try to build out all those little pieces that kind of span the gap in between you trying to put all these pieces together yourself and just having something that you can download and run and, and you've got all the pieces there. So whether that be things around logging, things around monitoring, things around um, being able to do things from a CLI. Um, and, 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 and really that, that's what you get in, in what's called our, our DCOS community edition. And then we've got an enterprise edition of the product as well. And that's where we're putting a lot more of the, 
well, enterprise features that are specific. Sure. And, I mean, I've, I've seen it. You guys have a lot of work done as far as the uh, human interface, too, like the interactivity of it, which tends to be a big sell for enterprise or for people who don't have the, I know how to run containers or C groups manually yeah. on Linux, right? Yeah. So you're making it more edible for yeah, the broader yeah, community. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the analogy that, that I, I, I probably overgive <laughs> is um, if you take something like OS X, uh. Uh, which is built on BSD and Darwin, which is a completely open source. Anybody can go download the BSD Darwin thing, uh, but that's not going to be my mom. She wants OS X. Yeah, that's yeah. what makes it edible, right? And so, so that's really what, what, what we're doing with the DCOS. So what, how are you guys going to approach the, the framework? Because most of the major successful ones are always tied to either custom framework or supporting one of the big ones like Aurora. So how, how, do, how do you, what's, the, what's the strategy there as far as enterprises and frameworks? Is there disciplines that need to be learned? Will they group together on a couple of them together or yeah, I mean, third parties or what? So, so for some of them, we just want it to be completely third party. So uh, the, the, the Basho guys announced a React framework. Yeah. And uh, we as a business, Maystore as a business, want them to be successful selling uh, React as a, as a framework on, on, on the DCOS. You know, yeah. we, we want them to be able to, to be able to do a business like that. And, and we want many organizations to be able to, to, to benefit from that as well. And so, um, uh, you know, Usually, what that ends up looking like is some kind of shared contractual, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, something business like. Yes, right? because 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 of course you know when when failures occur, who knows where in the stack they occur, and you know, right. first first level triage and, and, and all that kind sure. of support. But yeah, I mean from from the perspective of, of those frameworks, you know we're not in the business of 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 owning all the frameworks. We're in the business of making it easy for other organizations to to build those those frameworks and 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 uh, build those services and then and then sell. Um, sell their software as well. Yep. Yep. And, and so that, that leads us actually into kind of probably the final question here of kind of a low hanging fruit that, that kind of happened in the OpenStack world was everything started ephemeral and then everything moved to, to stateful over time. Um, and, and actually if you go look at the, the MesosCon um, hashtag on Twitter, one of the big sessions today was, was persistent. Uh, applications, you know, with persistent applications or stateful data, however you want to kind of look at it. And, yeah. and we started hearing about that or kind of around velocity conference. Um, what, what's kind of going on there a little yeah. bit? Um, cause is, is that truly like where the customers are wanting to take the environment? Is that yeah. a kind of a safe way to like, when you, when you talk to customers, what do they want to do? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I think that's exactly that's exactly what's happening <laughs> is is or, or organizations are basically saying um uh hey this is great um can you also run our our redises and our you know in our reacts and our and our cassandras and our uh, uh kafkas and our <laughs> uh mysqls and our postgres and so forth and so on and um and, and and honestly i think it's where some of the most interesting primitives end up being created because uh the advantage of the ephemeral ones is that some of the hard problems can easily be dealt with. Like the machine dies, you just reschedule it someplace right, else, right? right. Um, and so, uh, so it has been a, it has been a, a push for the Mesos community to be looking specifically at at, at the, the stateful primitives, as we call, call as we call them. Um, and and I think we're going to do even more of that. And and you know, our goal is to be able to have great relationships with. Um, uh, uh, just like we want to have a great relationship with a company like Basho, have great relationships with all organizations that want to run stateful services and and make sure that they can do that really, really, really well on, on top of the DCOS, top of Mesos. Yeah, fantastic. All right, uh, so we are out of time for today. I got one last question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Nick. Okay, so this is, this is a bit of a... Um, from Nick a one, Nick, Nick, Nick's got one more thing he's this, this, this is a nerd question. All right, right here. here we go. Um, so you've been involved on the Mesos stuff since, like, day one, right? Yeah. So as a person that's, you know, you've always seen these ideas you want to put in there and stuff, and then it scales and more yeah. people go in. What is the one thing that you wish you could either redo or that you wish you could get in but you don't have time to put it in? The one feature, trick, something that you wish you could tweak that you just don't have time What's either for your mulligan or your dream feature? Yeah. <laughs> the one thing um, that nags you at night, you wish you had time or you could have done. Yeah. So, um, so, so here's, here's probably the... the, the this is really, really weird, but the dream feature would have probably been this. Um, uh, uh, I, I got to, you know, make sure that's the right thing I want to say on air. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 I wish that we would have actually made really launching a single task or like a 
collection of tasks, like really in a really dumb way, just be something that we did straight up without you having to write that scheduler, that first level scheduler. Oh, wow. Because what ended up being a uh, hurdle for a bunch of people in the early days was this, wait, I got to run Mesos, and then I got to download Aurora, or I got to download Marathon, oh, yeah. and then I got to run that, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, being the you know, nerdy academic, I was like, well, in the old days, you downloaded Linux, and then you downloaded, like, whichever <laughs> yeah. this like, is better. like, like, yeah. like yeah. Uh, window manager you wanted on top. And this way, you got to, you got to pick, right? right? Do you want GNOME, or do you want KDE? Right. Or, like, you know, it's, it's totally fine. But that's not where the world's at these days. The world's just like, I get Ubuntu, I get, you know, Rail, like, maybe I switch my window manager, but probably not, right? Right. And so what ends up happening is uh, then uh, uh, some, people, you know, some people will say, well, this is too complicated. It's, like, too much stuff that we're doing. Anyway, you know, so we're solving a lot of those problems with the DCOS, right? We're just right. making this all be a single integrated thing that you can have and you can run. But, um, uh, uh, you know, perhaps we would have we thrown in a, I'll call it a default meta scheduler. You know, we wouldn't have changed the architecture at all whatsoever, right. but there would have just been this kind of default dumb thing. It'd been a, just, the demo mode, basically. The, the way, demo right? mode, yeah. yeah. Just like, yeah. yeah, which is like, you know, you, you, when you launch it up, you can, you can just type, you know, on the command line, meso space run, yeah. and, you know, you get something. But it's not going to have all the bells and whistles of a really, really well-written, well-written uh, scheduler, scheduler yeah. on top, like an Aurora or Marathon or right. one of these things, but at least you could, like, bring that the, stuff The up. hello world. Of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. I don't know if that's a good answer, but no, that's no. a pretty that's a pretty good answer. All right, I like that's that. That's a good answer. All right, so we are out of time for today. Uh, ben, where can everyone find out more about you and and what you have going on? Yeah, so I the, the two two best sites are uh, mesosphere dot com and uh, mesos dot apache dot org. Awesome, very 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 cool. All right, so thank you for your time today, and uh, thank you Nick for co hosting again, and thanks for listening, everyone. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media.